Nation. Hello everyone and welcome back to Show and Tell. This is probably going to be my last episode for the year. I'm Billy and I'm your host and you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Billy Toy and I'll put the spelling on the screen. So as we wind down the year, I just wanted to update you on a little bit of my knitting and on a few things that have been happening recently. So first of all, I think I had mentioned in a prior episode that I, I wanted to wear this hat, but one day when I was wearing it in the streets of New York, a big wind came along and it blew the feather right out. I think the feather was old and maybe softened up with age. I was surprised when I took my hat off that the feather was completely gone. So I went online looking and I wasn't able to find a single black feather, which is what I was shooting for. So a friend of mine in the knitting community in New York had mentioned to me, there's a shop in Midtown called Mood. I think it's Mood Fabrics. And I had never been there and she said, oh, they have everything. So I went there. I was looking for two things. I was looking for a feather. I was also looking for a toggle for this sweater, which I had knit. I showed this on a previous episode. Um, it takes a toggle. There's a loop that you knit. And anyway, so I, I went to the place that she recommended and because it is a mind-blowing place. I made a little video of it, which I'll insert here, and I'll show you. Besides their big production at street level, which is, I think, for maybe upholstery fabrics, they have several floors inside of an office building. You have to go up in an elevator, and then between their floors, they have escalators. But even though they had feathers, and I'll show you a, a little tour of their department where they had feathers. They didn't have what I was looking for. They had everything but. So they recommended that I go to a place called Pacific Trimming, which is on West 38th Street. Pacific Trimming had the toggle that I was looking for, which is this. And I don't know if you can see, but with this leopard print, I think it's gonna go pretty well. This is a pattern that was in Vogue Knitting Magazine a number of years ago. And they had a really interesting toggle like this. And since I plan to accessorize this with some silver jewelry, maybe some ethnic silver jewelry, I thought this was a pretty good fit for what I was going for. So I was able to get that. It cost me, I think, a whopping 50 or 75 cents. But... I had all but given up because I really didn't know where else to go. But in that district where it's like the garments, the old garment center, there are a lot of trim places. A lot of them are to the trade only. But I happened to be passing by and I saw this window that had a lot of feathers in it. They were getting ready to close. I was probably the last person that they were going to let into the store. So B&Q Trim hooked me up. Not only did they have this feather, they had every color under the rainbow. So if I ever want to change this out to match a sweater, I can go back there and buy all the feathers I want. I think that was 50 cents. Big spender. The program is called Show and Tell. And I do, as you know, from time to time, have people come on and show what they're knitting and talk about it. And I tend to show and talk about my things. But really the name... No one's asked me yet, but I thought you might be interested to know, well, where did this name come from? 
So if you're American, you probably had the same experience in elementary school that I did. There was a day that was called show and tell day where kids were asked to bring in something from home that they would show and tell about. So I've talked a little bit before about my mother. I had a very unusual mother, I must say. The fact that she divorced my dad at a time when people were not getting divorced unless they were Hollywood celebrities in itself was unique. I was the only child in my class whose parents were divorced. There was one year that our whole family, my aunt and uncle and my cousins and a bunch of us, well, the grandmothers and so forth, all went to Miami Beach to the Fountain Blue Hotel. We were a big gang of people. That was over our Christmas break from school. And after New Year's, everybody was heading home, so we got on the plane, we came back to Philadelphia, and as soon as we walked in the door to our apartment, my mother turned and said to me, I have my bag packed, I'm leaving you, I'm going back to the airport, I'm getting on the next plane out, and I'm meeting Aunt Audrey and Uncle Irv and some other friends in Puerto Rico. I'm going to leave you home alone. I was already a teenager by then. I was probably like 15 or 16. I'm going to leave you home alone, but you have to promise me that you won't tell Granny because she wouldn't have found me old enough to be going to school by myself and cooking for myself and taking care of myself for another week. Anyway, the upshot of that was my mother would always come home wherever she went with interesting souvenirs. And when I was young, this was one of those souvenirs that I brought into school to show to my classmates. Now, if you know what this is, I'd love for you to comment below before I go any further, but of course you'll see this. And anyway, it'll be spoiled. But as far as I know, this is a Caribbean form of a yo-yo, and I'm going to try and demonstrate for you. I hope it works. It hasn't been used for a long time. And there you have it. These are some kind of shells from a nut. Over the years, I see this one's starting to crack. It's just a simple little string in there, just like a yo-yo would be, but how cool a thing is that for a kid to bring to like first or second grade to show? I've never seen anything like it since. One year she brought me back bongos. A lot of times she brought castanets. Um, she tended to go to places in the Caribbean where there were casinos and resorts. So I thought that I would show you a little show-and-tell object from my childhood. And I'd love for you to comment below if you took things to school to show-and-tell, what were some of the things that you can recall showing back then? In my last episode, when I was chatting with some of the guests who have come on my show, you might remember that Michelle Mark mentioned winter solstice, December 21st, and the age of Aquarius, that these planets were going to align. Well, it turned out it's not Jupiter aligning with Mars, like in the song, but it was Saturn aligning with Jupiter. And because she had mentioned it, my husband and I and our son decided to do a little research to find out what were some of the best viewing places and online we found that it's really good to be in a, a wide open space, like a park. So where we live, there are quite a few small parks, but I didn't think they were gonna have a good vantage point for seeing the horizon. So we headed over to the river. We live in Manhattan, as I've mentioned, and Manhattan is bounded by two rivers. On the east side, it's the East River. On the west side, it's the Hudson River. And from what we read online, this planet sighting was best viewed to the south and the west. So I thought, okay, if we go west, we're going to run into the river, and we'll head south a little bit and see if there are places along 
the waterfront where there aren't buildings uh, that would obstruct our view. So we started to walk a little south after we got over to the river. And it was a pretty cold night. Sunset was at 4.30. And online we read that within two hours after sunset is the best viewing time. So we were out there. I had binoculars. Uh, let me show you my binoculars one second. I have these pretty powerful compact binoculars that I've taken on trips with me. They're Nikon. They're 8 by 20. So it's 8 times magnification. And it's pretty clear. You can adjust um, one side and then focus. They're pretty decent quality. All I could see were airplanes. I could see the flashing lights um, using the binoculars and with our naked eye even less. So we thought, well, we'll give it a little more time. It was a sort of cloudy night. The clouds were coming and going. But by about 5.15, we were cold and disappointed. And we turned to leave. And I'm telling you, it wasn't more than 15 feet that we walked, that we encountered a small group of people gathered around something, and we thought, well, what's that? And then we saw this guy had set up a large telescope with some kind of little viewfinder on the side that you could look into and see. And he wasn't charging people. He was just like there, Come one, come all, just get in line, socially distance. We waited our turn, and we could see it. I actually saw Saturn, and I saw the rings around it, and Jupiter, the little moons, very clearly around it. Now, this guy, he was some kind of a dream. I don't know where, what planet this guy fell down from, but he had these little clamps on the side of his telescope, that were holders for cell phones, but not all cell phones are the same size. So he had three different attachments that he would swap out. And he was encouraging people to put their cameras in there and take pictures. Now the pictures, and I will put my pictures here so you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. The pictures are not nearly as clear as what I saw when I looked into his viewfinder. It was a night I will never forget. It, it was unbelievable to see those rings. When I was in high school, there was a solar eclipse, and my high school physics teacher took a group of us students from Philadelphia to Norfolk, Virginia. We camped out on someone's living room floor. So I've seen, at this point in my life, two solar eclipses. One was a, a couple of years ago, and that one back when I was in high school, and now this. And each one is so memorable. You just never forget where you were and who you were with and what device you used. Anyway, that, that's part of what's been going on this week. Episode, you saw me working on my Thelma Viscountess Furness pattern that I'm designing, and I've made a bit more progress. Um, it's a little hard to see, but this is a sweater that I knit in the 1980s, and it has a rather large dolman sleeve. So I've been kind of using this, not totally, but kind of using this as a, like a template. I tried a couple of other things. It's going to be hard to show you here, but I don't want my current sleeve to be quite as wide as this. So this is trial and error. I'm now at the point where I am uh, doing short rows to inch up towards the shoulder and I've allowed some room for 
couple of inches of cuff at the end of this. Um, but this is a work in progress, and I'm sure you'll be seeing it again. In addition to my hat, I always like to talk about my accessories. I have these two lucite bracelets, which I used to import from Italy, and uh, a sterling silver brooch from Mexico with a couple of little gemstones in it. This was purchased by my Aunt Matilda. And uh, Mexican sterling earrings from Tosco. So I thought that picked up the uh, shades of gray in my jacket. I will probably be starting in, in the not too distant future a new project. I'm waiting for replacement yarn to come in. Uh, the first yarn that I ordered I wasn't happy with the colors. So that's something that uh, you can look forward to. So I know a lot of you drink coffee or tea, tea in particular it seems, while you're kicked back and knitting. And I've also noticed that a lot of you with advent calendars are finding tea bags in them. So I thought this might be a really interesting opportunity for me to share with you once again some objects from my local fantastic art museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm going to show you some things that are specifically related to tea that I think you'll find interesting. And I'm also going to tell you a little bit about tea, but I'm going to do that as I'm showing you the images, so you're not going to see my face at that point. Before I leave you, I, I want to make sure that I don't forget to wish you a most happy new year. I am quite certain that 2021 will bring better things our way. There's no question in my mind. <laughs> we can only go up. I hope everybody's got their knitting projects and that you're happily knitting away since, unfortunately, this year we can't spend much time with friends and family as we normally would. So please accept my sincere good wishes and I'd love to hear from you. I'd, I'd love to hear your comments. So please write, send letters, send postcards. Take good care, everyone. I'll see you in 2021. Bye. But stay around for the tea. There's some really interesting things. Okay, take care. We tend to associate tea with China, Japan, England, and India. But you may not know that tea was first cultivated 6,000 years ago in China. The original tea plant is similar to what we grow today, but it was eaten as a vegetable or cooked with porridge back then. It didn't become a beverage until 1500 years ago when people realized that when they combined it with heat and moisture, it made for a complex flavored beverage. Preparation methods have changed for hundreds of years until the standard was to heat tea leaves by packing them into small cakes and grinding them into powder to make a drink called matcha. It became so popular that tea was the subject of books and poetry and the drink favored by emperors. Artists created designs in the foam similar to what espresso baristas do today. It wasn't until the ninth century that a Japanese monk brought a tea plant to Japan leading to the Japanese creating their own unique tea culture. In the 14th century, China shifted the standard to loose leaf tea. They still held a virtual monopoly on tea trees and tea ranked with silk and porcelain as their top exports. This gave China a lot of power and influence as tea drinking spread around the world. 
in the 1600s, Dutch ships brought large quantities of tea to Europe. At that time, Great Britain was becoming a dominant power, expanding its colonial influence around the world. The interest in tea spread alongside their expansion. Tea cost 10 times as much as coffee, and payment in silver became too expensive. It was at that point that trading opium for tea began, leading to addiction to the drug. A Chinese official had massive incoming shipments of opium destroyed to stop the British influence over China, which created the first opium war between those two nations. Fighting continued up and down the coast of China until 1842, when China ceded Hong Kong to the British. The British East India Company wanted to grow tea themselves to control the market. They commissioned botanist Robert Fortune to steal tea from China in a covert operation, disguising himself as a Chinese and journeying into the mountainous tea regions. He smuggled trees and tea workers into Darjeeling, India. From there, the trees spread further. Today, tea is the second most consumed beverage after water. Here you see a group of Japanese tea ceremony objects, a fire pot, a freshwater jar, ladle, the fire tongue, kettle, the lid rest for the kettle, and a brazier, the container for hot coals. While this octagonal shape tea caddy emulates contemporary English design of the early 18th century, this example happens to be an American one. It evokes the passion for tea drinking and the costly accessories that became as fashionable in the colonies as they were abroad. It's engraved with the arms and crest of the Bayard family of New York. And last but not least, we have the coffee and tea service, Déjeuner Chinois Reticulé from 1855, the Sèvres Manufactory of France. This is the most incredible set I've ever seen. The various shapes employed for this exuberant service evoke both China and the Near East, the origins of tea and coffee, respectively. The Sèvres factory described the service as a déjeuner chinois réticulé, or a Chinese service, with open-work decoration, but its fidelity to Chinese models is slight. The shape of the tray with its scrolling feet is based on Chinese lacquerware and the double-walled forms with open-work exteriors appear to have been inspired by Chinese porcelains sold in Paris in 1826. Additional Chinese-inspired elements include the simulated bamboo handles and the painted Chinese emblems, but the profusion of decorative motifs and the color scheme of white, pink, and gold are entirely European in character. This blending of Asian forms with European decoration reflected the taste for exoticism in mid-19th century France. It's not clear if services of this design were intended for display or for use, but several were given as diplomatic gifts by French Queen Marie Amélie, the wife of King Louis Philippe, who reigned from 1830 to 1848. She purchased at least seven examples between 1835 and 1843. The double-walled openwork construction was very difficult to produce, and the factory's obvious success demonstrated its considerable technical expertise.